Hey everybody, so I am super super excited to tell you all about my BGG 2021. There's a lot to talk about and I'm going to try to show you as many close-ups as possible of the cool things that I brought back with me or some images of games that I played that I already have or that I got some pictures of. The first thing I want to mention is, ooh, cool swag. So, first thing, I am wearing a Board Game Geek convention shirt from, you guess it, this is not this year's theme, the good, the bad, and the geek. This is from a previous Board Game Geek con. So if you want to write in the comments below what year you think this is, or if you know for a fact what year this is, definitely write in the comments below. I can't wait to see what your guesses are. and. I've got my badge right here. How exciting is it? I haven't been to a con in two years to get a badge and to get the bracelet. There's just something really exciting and thrilling about returning to in-person conventions and just seeing all of those friendly faces and having a great community experience over board games. I'm thrilled. I just can't tell you how much fun I had and what a great experience going back to Dallas was this year for Board Game Geek Con 2021. I also wanted to mention something really cool that you can see right here on the wall. It's probably going to find a place into my nook somewhere a little bit more permanently, but I think you probably all know I am a college professor and I had a peer mentor in a student orientation, a freshman orientation course this semester, and she was fantastic, so shout out to Emily. And she painted this for me, and if you can see, it says Tabletop Tolson, and it is accidentally my playing color and my husband's playing color. She did not know that I play green and that he plays yellow, it's a perfect, perfect picture, and I love it, so thank you, and I just love all the support that I'm getting from viewers and people and friends and just loved ones. Um, another quick shout out, too, to Alejandro. He actually came up to me in the Hot Games room at Board Game Geek and just wanted to say hi and that he really likes the channel and just thinks that it's awesome and that Lewis and I are fun and cool people, and I just thought that was the neatest. So. Um, Thank you, and please say hi to me if you see me anywhere. I think in the next year we're going to be going to hopefully some more cons and seeing each other face to face, and I think that's great. And also, big kudos to Alejandro for recognizing me while I was wearing a mask and had my glasses on. So, <laughs> really, really good eyes there. So the first thing I wanted to talk about uh, regarding BGG Con is that it was in the um, Hyatt Regency downtown, which is a really, really big uh, hotel and space. Just giant halls. We had a lot of playing space. This year, there were, I think, around 1,900 um, attendees. And that's down, obviously, from higher numbers between four and 6,000. And it didn't feel smaller, though. I, I don't know what was going on. Um, it just felt nice-sized. I ran into a lot of people that I knew. I also made a lot of friends. And that's one of the things I noticed about this year. Because some of my regular friends who attend didn't go, I was able to kind of play with other people and get to know some other gamers and it was really delightful meeting some wonderful new gamers. The uh, rooms weren't necessarily super jam-packed because of the size, the library was easy to navigate through, and the Hot Games room, while it was pretty popular, you could get into a game. I finally got into a game on Saturday night. So I think the experience of being in that hotel and being in that space for the second year now, because obviously last year was bumped, uh, the year before that was the first time we moved downtown. It's nice. They have some really great offerings for food, and because it's downtown, you can get to other places outside of the hotel for food, which I think is really nice. Some of the events um, didn't happen this year, and I don't know exactly what the reason is for that, but I'll tell you one thing. The event that I love the most, the thing I look forward to throughout the year, and the second it's over, I'm devastated because I have to wait an entire year for, is the Puzzle Hunt. 
I love the puzzle hunt. It is a two hour, now it's moving into three hours, but the premise of everything still remains the same. So you have two hours to complete any number of puzzles that you get in a manila envelope. You register your team the second you show up to the con so that you can participate in it. Normally it's been on Saturdays from two to four. And you have four people on a team and you just go. There are no rules, there are no instructions. These are puzzles that are out of the box. They are creative, they are just these puzzly things, and I adore them, and I adore my group, I adore my team. If you've been watching the channel, you actually have seen some pictures of my Puzzle Hunt team of recent. I, I posted some of those pictures in a video where I just kind of appreciate the people that I play games with and why I go to cons, and so I really, really miss Puzzle Hunt this year. I also sometimes... Uh, play in the poker tournament. I absolutely love poker. The thing is, is when I play, I usually play and it's about four, four and a half hours later, I finally get back to board gaming and everyone's been playing all these games and I feel like I miss out. So this year I forwent the poker tournament and then I heard in BGG history, uh, we had a woman uh, champion and I thought that was great news to hear. So kudos to the winner for the board game poker tournament. Way to go. I'm glad you won. Um, and then lastly, there were, um, I think there was the Battling Tops. Not my thing, but I'm glad that it happened. Uh, it was on the schedule, so I assume it happened. I don't know exactly where. Normally in the other hotels I was able to hear them because it's a very loud and exciting event, um, even though I've never participated in it. Uh, so there were still some events that the convention held for gamers, and I love that. So. Fingers doubly, triply, quadruply crossed for Puzzle Hunt 2022. <laughs> Is that next year? <laughs> I'm already getting confused. You can tell I might be a little jet lagged still. This is like coming straight off of flying back um, two time zones from Dallas uh, to Idaho. So um, still probably just a little tired of super late nights and really early mornings because we game all day, all night, all the way through from Wednesday until Sunday, um, and it's just fantastic. The exhibit hall was um, pretty small this year, but the people that were there were wonderful and lovely, offering demos and offering games and just lots of fun new things for me to um, look at. So I just wanted to mention that we walked by and we're talking with the folks who have Maglev Metro, and they ended up giving us a package of the bronze little people stands. They're wooden and they did that because they had a reprint um, of the game with those figures. They said it was a fluorescent light issue that when they made the bronze and the gold they really looked very different but then when you're under different lights then the bronze and the gold are very close together and when we played the game we kept getting them confused too. And so they realized it was just a, an error and they wanted to give everybody who was getting the game new or who already had the game a little package of the bronze figures and there is a noticeable difference and just yay. Thank you so much and we're really excited to add that to our box of Maglev Metro. We stopped by WizKids and ended up picking up two games, which were the only two games that we bought the entire convention. One of them is the new updated version of Super Skill Pinball, which has four more arcades. So you have your dry erase boards and it's just like the original Super Skill Pinball. I have a whole video tutorial about that if you want to check it out in my channel. Just go and look for Super Skill Pinball for Cade. And this has other ways to play it, some kind of familiar, some easier, some more challenging. Um, uh, Zev talked to me about it and said that you should probably start with the easier one and work your way into each one of them, but just know that there's a different functionality or different, you know, mechanism for each of them that kind of makes it fresh and fun and exciting. So yay, I'm super excited for that. I use Super Skill Pinball and other roll and writes in my classroom this semester for basic composition writing, and I'm really excited to get through the entire semester to see how that game implementation worked for my students. The other game we picked up at WizKids is Dungeon Scrawlers, and Dungeon Scrawlers just looks awesome. 
dungeon crawling but you're also writing and so you've got these dry erase boards and you are kind of like crawling your way through the dungeon and you can't backtrack or turn around and cross over any lines you've done before and you're essentially drawing your way through this dungeon trying to grab as much stuff as you can and get out the exit so yay it looks super super exciting and i'm really excited about those two games we also demoed a game in the Exhibitor Hall that was called Honey Buzz with the Autumn Expansion updates. And so right now they're running a thing on Kickstarter where you can actually get the base game and you can also get the expansion that adds another element of play along with other components and pieces that add to and enhance your experience of the base game Honey Buzz. You can also just go to their website and buy Honey Buzz if you want the game now. If you Kickstarter it, that means that you're going to get the base game when the expansion is essentially produced and released and sent to you, which as everyone knows with Kickstarter games is a little bit later. Um, the game is really good. I enjoyed it. I thought it was a great individual puzzly game with your worker placement and your kind of bidding over other people by having to place more pawns to do the same action if there's already a pawn there and you're activating one of six different actions that you do on your own little honeycomb beehive area that you've got built in front of you you're essentially gathering resources and then you are selling those resources in a variety of ways to get certain things and configurations um, it's a it's a really smart game and I liked the expansion. I like the additions the fall or the autumn um, Flavor and those components Really really cool. So I had a great experience with honey buzz and all the other cool stuff that they are now running on Kickstarter Lastly, I stopped at the BGG store and I picked up two things essentially I had got some little cloth bags I got five in five different colors so when you get the bag it, you can fit your hand in it but also you can put some stuff in there it's not like a giant bag and I got it because I was running all of these roll and writes in my classroom this year and I didn't have enough bags for, for all the different things and so I was kind of like heisting bags from other dice bags and, and they were all different sizes and some were too small for people to really fit their hands in and draw out. Uh, for games like Rolling America where you only reach in and draw two dice out at the same time while you leave other dice in the bag. So I am going to take those to school and make sure that I have some extra cloth bags and I really like the colors and I like the quality and they were so affordable they were a dollar each <laughs> how can I pass up bags that are a dollar each um, and then the last thing I got was a little figurine stand for wingspan and it's just the first player marker all souped up but I have to soup it up myself because it is unpainted and I really thought it looked awesome and I saw so much potential for this bird as a stand first player marker so when I have time don't know when that's gonna be but when I have time you better believe it I am going to paint that little wingspan and add it to my beautiful wingspan collection uh, maybe I'll show it off here on my little bookshelf first um, but that's really exciting and of course I love planning for the future who knows when I'm gonna have time but I would love to paint that little guy Okay, so moving on to the hot games. I got to play three hot games and they were really, really cool. The first one I got to play is called Witchstone. And in Witchstone, players are trying to puzzle together in their own player area these pieces that kind of remind me of Quirkle, where you're placing down tiles and you are trying to connect the same shape or symbol and every time you activate one that has a run of more of the same symbol, you get to do that thing that many times. You get to activate it that many times. So every player has their own witch cauldron and you are putting these two-sided, they're, they're like little uh, rectangles, they're more shapely than rectangles. And you are placing them down in this kind of circular grid that allows you to connect these shapes and they let you do pretty much everything that's on the board, grabbing cards, um, that you can fulfill those contracts. You are going out and you're sending your witches out on the board to create these designs on this map and you're trying to grab up first uh, arrival tokens where the first player to get there gets a really cool bonus. It reminds me a lot of Ticket to Ride where if you make shorter paths, like a one level, 
um, or a two level, then there are fewer victory points than if you make a three level path. There are a lot of really great things to love about Witchstone, and I'm going to tell you one thing right now. Lewis was ahead of me the entire game by probably 20 points. He just stayed ahead of me, and one time I caught up to him in the same round, and after that he was gone. And I kept thinking, what is going on? There's no chance. How am I going to win this game? And I just kept feeling despair. But at the end, I realized I had way more investment in the end game scoring than I did in the in game scoring. And so that's where I pulled ahead. So there's something a little tricky about Witchstone visually. You'll see that one player is ahead on the victory point track and they're getting a lot of stuff. Don't let that discourage you and just understand there's in game points and then there is end game points. And so keep that in mind when you play Witchstone because it's really, really cool. I also played Azul, Queen's Garden, and I thought it was interesting. It definitely had this feel and flavor of kind of the first and the third, in my opinion, of the previous Azuls. So the one thing it has about Summer Pavilion is it has all of these different colors and sections of things, but they're not set in stone. So you actually get to kind of manipulate and get a variety of things that you want. You don't have to do just the colors that are listed and the colors that are printed in those places. Now in um, Queen's Garden, you have the same thing where you place tiles down, but it's not about the tile based on how many are previously placed because there's fewer restrictions. Like I said, you get a variety of playing either color or style or shape. So there are six different flowers and then there are six different colors. And you might have one flower printed on a particular color, but then you have the same design printed on another color. And so there's a way for you to go from color to flower to a different flower to, do you see, you can see like there's this overlap because when you play, the thing adjacent just needs to match the color or the flower and you can play adjacent to it or you can just play anywhere else you want. Now in uh, this game in Queen's Garden you get to circle, go around things and get bonuses much like you do in Summer Pavilion and I think it just has this very very interesting feel to it that felt more fluid. It felt more I don't know, I felt like people were doing a variety of things on their turn. We had a really great instruction from a lovely stranger who sat down and wanted to teach it to his friend, and then Lewis and I were kind of sitting there looking, you know, befuddled and confused because we didn't know how to play the game. <laughs> and so he taught it to us and did a great job, and I think we totally, like, figured it out, but it was after that first round or so. There are different points of scoring in this game, everyone's kind of doing their own thing, and it, it, it's really clean. It's really, it's clear and it makes sense and I think that, that there's this dynamic draw that's very different from any other version of Azul. So I think Azul Queen's Garden really offers something new in the realm of Azul that if you like Azul, you will find pleasing. You will find satisfying. And wherever you really find yourself in the Azuls, like you like you know, one over two over three or you know whatever, I think you'll find something really nice about this fourth version of Azul and how it works, particularly how you draw your tiles. I liked that the most. And I liked the restrictions you had with the placement. You, you had to essentially do a Castles of Burgundy. I take tiles or I take a disc, which I can add to my board, but I take a tile and I put it in my holding area. And then as another, when it comes back around to me as another turn, I can then take anything from there and build it into my area. And so I like that feel, I like that staging, and that's so Castles, and Castles is my favorite game, period. It still is my favorite game of all time. So it takes that me mechanic of grabbing and, and doing different things on your turn. You don't have to just take tiles. You don't have to just build circles. You don't have to just build tiles. You can, you can do a variety of those things. And you're going to get bonuses along the way if you are kind of building in these particular areas. So Azul, Queen's Garden, I want to play again. I want to get to add to the collection so we have all four of them now. But I think there's something there, and I really want to give it another try because I didn't win it. <laughs> Maybe that's part of it, too. I really want to win it. Um, I was so happy that Lewis won, though, because rarely does he win a game of Azul. And so, yay! That's super exciting! <laughs> the last top game that I played um, was 
Gutenberg. And Gutenberg is a nice, juicy, kind of bidding programming game. And so what you're doing is you are bidding for priority in five different actions. So you've got these bid tokens, and the first player that goes in the round has fewer. They get seven. And then the next player that goes gets eight, then nine, and then ten. And so when you're last to go, you actually get more bid tokens that you program hidden so no one can see, and you start programming, well, for the first action when we take, um, like, print cards, I want to probably go sooner than later, so I'll put more of my bid tokens in that spot. And then you have to figure out, okay, well, if I want to do this action at all, I have to place a bid token. So then you place one. But you're like, nah, I don't really need to go first. Um, it, uh, turn order doesn't matter. I can take any of those things. You put one. Because you're like, it'll just go in turn order then. And so forth. And you just keep kind of programming your little tokens. Everyone reveals. And then you just go down the board. The board from top to bottom says, here, you're going to take these print cards. Next, you're going to bid for ink. And ink are the little cute little droplets. Next, you're going to bid for your kind of skills, and you want to upgrade your skills and get better at those because that's how you actually fulfill your contracts. And then you're going to get these cogs, and these cogs get to turn every single turn and give you super cool bonuses that apply to getting victory points or trading in tiles or getting new letters. Very cool. And then the last one is getting bonuses. And so you can get some freebies. In the beginning, you're going to get freebies. And then later, you're going to start buying some of the things that require you to turn things in or have skill in those kind of skill areas. It's a really clean game. It's really smart. I had a great time playing it. And I definitely want to give it another try. I think it's something that takes a, a try or two to kind of lock in and figure out the balance of how do I apply this, how do I do this, how do I use my bonuses. So Gutenberg, really, really good game. It's not available right now as far as I can tell uh, in the U.S. in English, and so it was great to play in the hot games to kind of get me excited about playing it again once it becomes available. Okay, so don't mind me. I've got my phone here so I can remember. I actually wrote down every single game that I played while I was there and the days that I played them. I'm going to provide a list of all the games that I played in the description for this video so you can see a comprehensive list. Um, and then I will tell you right now just some of the highlights of the games that I played and um, why I liked them. So on the very first day, we were able oh, we played Xenon Profiteer. <laughs> I like that game. Oh, I've, I've talked a lot about it on this channel. I think it's very underrated. It's a wonderful deck builder, very fast, really clean, super easy, and it's just it's just delicious. We just love playing it. So we ended up playing a three-player game of that. Had a great time. A uh, friend suggested it, and so we said, yes, I will always play Xenon Profiteer. We also played uh, another game of Anno 18, and I heard a lot of people talking about Anno 18. We have that, and we played it before we went to the convention, and it was really good to play it again. I enjoyed it even more the second time, because I knew what the cards were, what the tiles were, I knew the pacing of the game, and I felt like I was really making some good choices. Now, whether or not they were good choices, I felt better about it, and I had a really great time. So I think Anno 18 just gets better the more you play it, and I think it's just a really strong game. And I also think that once you get past the start um, shared goals, you can get into other goals that are set up in the beginning of the game, and you know, well, when I do this, this is going to earn me more victory points, this is going to earn more victory points, this is going to be a cool thing. And everybody gets to score those, but they change every game, and I like that. I played Free Ride, and Free Ride was... It was only a two-player game, so we didn't get in each other's way too much, but it's a freedom and freeze rail-building game that absolutely is trans-Europa, but just like more. I think it, it, it's obviously got more going on, but if you're, you're familiar with trans-Europa, you place down these black uh, little rectangle, little um, kind of pipes that are your, your tracks, and everybody can use them as long as they're adjacent to them. Well, in this game, in Free Ride, you own those particular trains until someone pays to use it and they pay a dollar to you, but then it becomes public rail. And so you only pay once and then you can ride on that rail after that because it's all just the same colored rail. So it, it makes it a little bit harder to use other people's rail, but it still makes it accessible. And all you're doing is, 
you're picking up and delivering, essentially, but you're just going from one city to the next city on these two cards. You're saying, I'm starting here and I'm going there, and you just ride your rail. Your trains get better as the game continues. There are ways to kind of upgrade or expand this game, and so I would look forward to seeing something that kind of made this game just even a little bit more dynamic or more interesting. I'd like to play it with more people. I had a really good time. I liked Free Ride. I played Seven Wonders Architects, and I think that it is a super slimmed down, interesting Seven Wonders. It's light, it's fun, it's easy to learn, it's super basic. You have two piles of cards, one that's between you and the player to your right, and one that's between you and the player to your left. And on your turn, you draw one from here, one from here, or one from the central pile that has just a bunch of cards in it. And it's just like the cards you have in your decks. The thing is, is you can see the top card of each deck, and you're like, hmm, do I want that? Do I want that? What's my opponent doing over there? What's my opponent doing over there? And you collect science. You collect the victory points. You co So the green cards, the blue cards. You have um, just getting you know, just fights, and then you have fights whenever fights are triggered. It's great, but it's like super, super pared down. Everybody has a different wonder that they're building, so they have different requirements and different bonuses, but it's not like so vastly challenging that you can't play it. It's great. It's great. It was just super duper light. I, I liked it. And fun. It was really easy to play. There were two games on Thursday that I really, really enjoyed. Yet again, Freedom and Freeze uh, had a game called Full Throttle. <laughs> and this one's all about racing bikes, bike racing. It's just like a super simple track. There's two sides. I played both sides. I played two games of it. One on Thursday and then one on Friday. Um, a two-player and then a three-player game. And you just bid on the bike racers coming in first, second, or third. And the way it works is super, super interesting where you draft cards as after a round goes and you see the bikers and what place they're in. You pass that deck around and everyone just takes a card. Now, what you don't think about is that once the cards get reshuffled, the cards you take out aren't in the reshuffled deck. So the ones you're investing in maybe won't be able to move that fast, and at the end, other bikers might finish because we're putting them back into the discard pile because we say, I don't want to invest in you, yet now they have a higher probability of getting selected than the people that you take out of the deck and say, I want to invest in this person. So it's this really weird... I don't know, is it like a light stock game because you're investing in them? But then when you invest, then it takes away from their ability to get around the track. It's great. I loved it. It was so fun. The theme is there. It's just light and silly. And it doesn't matter whether you win or lose. Um, it's, it's really fun. So the other game that I enjoyed playing was Micro Macro Full House. Now, it's just Micro Macro, like Crime City. But now it's just another map with a whole bunch of other mysteries and like detective work needed. And we played three games. Um, essentially, there were three packets of cards, and they walk you through, you know, look for this and look for that. And it's just like a Where's Waldo on this giant map, uh, black and white. And you're looking at all these different figures, and it's just really, really fun and interesting. It was just the two of us, Lewis and me, and we would um, look at the card, and they would say, you know, What's, what's funny about this? What did the murderer not, you know, consider when they staged the, the crime scene? And you have to look for clues and you have to think about, like, well, what would, why, why is this weird? Why is this funny? What's going on here? And you have to follow people walking through the city and where they came from and who they met along the way. And it's just delightful. We played an easy one, then we played a medium one, then we played a little bit harder. So a one star, uh, a, I think actually it was a two star a three star and a four star and so they're in, in a five star rating of easy to difficult and so we had a great time and I think it was just a, like loads of fun and you could play as many of those little mystery packets as you want play easier ones play harder ones easy for people to join and for everyone just to be like on a little corner of the map looking at their stuff um, it's fun I really liked it there were two games that I played that day as well that kind of reminded me of other games. And while I thought it was fine, it wasn't necessarily overwhelming. The one that I played is King Domino Origins, and I thought that it was very similar to King Domino um, and added just a little bit. And I was like, okay, but it felt like I was just playing King Domino or Queen Domino. Um, and so 
not necessarily adding too much to the experience despite us playing through two of the three kind of games in, in the game of Origins because there are different components for the second phase and then there are different components yet again for the third kind of phase where you add things to um, the base, base game of the uh, Origins box. I also played The Hunger and The Hunger is a really highly thematic um, game that just reminds me too much of Clank for it to be anything other than um, like a clank. Want, like it just really wants to be clank but like different. And so um, you start in the castle and it spirals out down this kind of village area and it goes up around the board and then it stops and there's just a road that you want to travel on. There's a road, a dirt road or a railroad and then there's like the water route and it's just you moving spaces on your turn based on the three cards you draw and then eating people and you're, you're a vampire so you prey on people and you there's like a whole human row where you're just eating humans or getting magic powers and adding those to your deck so it's a deck builder and you're racing against the clock because you are trying to race out and get as much stuff and then race back and so there's a press your luck to it um, and again it just felt like it felt like clank but not clank because it's vampires I thought the theme was really great um, there is a problem sometimes with the press your luck because Press your luck generally says all or nothing, and when it's nothing, then you feel like you know you've really spent uh, a large amount of your time, and you get nothing for it. Obviously, you get a zero, and that's just a little. That's a little hard, right? It's just harsh, you know. When there's like a whole table of people, <laughs> and you have six people playing, and five people make it back, and one doesn't, and you're like, oh, it's just like hard to like celebrate and be and be happy <laughs> for everybody. Um, so. Eh. A little bit there um, but it was it was generally fun I had a good time I thought the theme was just like on point um, and it was it was pretty easy to take your turn and do all your stuff so we had we had a, a, a relatively good time with it it's just kind of clank there were a couple games that we played and we already have a copy of it or have played some version of it as well we played Cascadia so Clover and Rolling Japan and those were just delightful. I have Rolling America. Rolling Japan was great. It was just a nice 15-20 minute game and it's it's just super fast and fun and I think it's just great. Um, so Clover is a really wonderful word game and I've played it enough now that I really really like it. It's becoming a favorite much like Just One. It's so replayable. It's great for a, a number of people. You can play with a lot of people with few people and it's just a wonderful word association game that's creative and just fun. And it's funny and you can play it anywhere, anytime. It's fantastic. And then playing Cascadia again, we played with different goal cards, and I found that it was very fun to play again. I had a great time, and we played with two people who had not played before, so it was really fun to see those strategies and to just play with some friends and have a good time with Cascadia, having already known the game and made a video about it. So if you want to check out my video about Cascadia, go look for it. It's there. I'll probably put it in the description above, so just check out Cascadia. It is a super game. Another game that I've played a version of is Horrified, and I got to play the New American Monsters Horrified. And so we have the base game, fantastic game. I know Lewis has mentioned before in one of our lists that he really, really likes that game. It still stands up, and I think the new board with the American Monsters and the way those monsters function are really cool. It's a nice other standalone game in the Horrified world that has different creatures and it's just cool like it fits and it kind of feels more American but it's really just more monsters you know and, and monsters that function differently from the ones that you're used to. I got to play a game that I have kickstarted that I haven't received my copy of yet it's called Vivid Memories and I bought it because it kind of reminds me of Calico and the placement of these little bitty gems um, that you fit into your board and you want to make these connections, you want to make these designs and you want to collect these memories because the memories are going to give you victory points but they're also going to give you cool actions. And I thought the game worked really well. It's surprisingly more complex than at first you think when you play. It seems, oh I just take this and I do that. And then once you score the first time and there are three scoring rounds, you start to realize, 
oh, this, I can do this and I can do that. And, and you end the game and it's, it, you finally get a feel for it. And I'm so glad I read the rules and, and played it at BGG. So when my copy comes in, I'll be ready to go and ready to share it with friends and ready to play it. We also played Project L and Lewis had kickstarted that as well. And it's just a nice polyomino um, fit them in the box kind of thing and you you take these cards and you place them in front of you you have a space for four different grid uh, for four different cards and you just have these polyominoes that you get to place in and you get three actions on your turn you get to place one in one you can take a card and add it to your supply your your kind of four card area or you can do a one time only one of your three actions a master build and you get to place one of your polyominoes into each of the cards that you have, however many cards you have. And you want to build these, finish them for victory points, and then they also give you more shapes and more things. Um, you can also exchange on your turn. You can upgrade from a small guy to a medium guy, from a medium guy to a hard guy. There are expansions that allow you to get bigger shapes that have more uh, design and, and different feel to them with more cards as well. It's just a lovely replayable game. Kind of reminds me of Ubongo, but with much better um, tactile feel. The pieces are lovely. They feel so nice and they're really, really pretty. So I can't wait to get our copy of Project L. Lastly, I played a handful of games on Saturday that I really enjoyed that I didn't expect to enjoy or didn't even know existed. One of them is called New Bedford and it is a really tight, light strategy game that just kind of surprises me still. Like when I think about how good it is, it, it just makes me really envious of the designers because I think it's a great worker placement game and it's, it has 16 rounds, but it doesn't feel like every round takes a long time because guess how many workers you have? Two! You have two workers. And so you place a worker out and do the thing. You place a worker out, you do a thing. Then you have your whaling section. So you send out your boats and your boats get to fish um, for whales. And if you get whales, then you put them in your ship hold and you have two different ships that you can send out at the same time and they can be essentially whaling um, as they get closer and closer to home. Every, to every round you have to move that ship closer to dock and when you dock, you have to pay for your whales. And if you don't have the money to pay for your whales, they go up for auction and other players can buy them. Meanwhile, you can build buildings that allow you to do cooler actions. You can go and sell resources for money. You can do all sorts of fun things. It was just so surprising how much I really liked this game. It's clean, it's small, it's just kind of perfect. Um, I'm, I'm having a hard time with the, <laughs> with the critique of, of this game. It probably was one of my top three games of the convention. Another game I really enjoyed, and I read the rules to before I went to BGG, is Groundhog Day. This game is like the movie. You go over and over and over, you keep waking up, you hit the alarm, and that starts the time for that particular round. But it functions like the game. And it's, it's really interesting because it's a cooperative game. Everybody is dealt a certain number of cards. In the beginning, you're dealt more cards than you are towards the end of the game. So you get fewer and fewer options and fewer and fewer cards to play on your turn. But there's no turn. Like that, that's the fun thing about this is once the timer starts, everybody just has to play a card in ascending order without talking to each other. And you want to make the perfect day, and you have seven cards to make a perfect day, and a perfect day is a four hearts, four hearts, four hearts, all the way across, and if you get seven cards that have four hearts on them, you win. Now, you can only play the four heart cards if you get them in your hand, and everyone else gets some four heart cards, and you can earn them along the way by playing other cards. So you're playing a round, and you have a low score of, let's say, seven hearts. Your next round, you take the cards that no one played, you leave the ones out, and you shuffle them into the whole pile, and you deal out fewer cards because you play with fewer and fewer every round, and you play again. Now you have to get higher than seven hearts, but not a perfect score yet because you're not there, you're not ready. And you play round after round after round after round after round until the deck is so small that there are so many four heart cards in there that you think it's time to play, but there's no strategizing because you can't talk to your players once you look at your hand. 
that's the timer starts. You, you start right then and you can't communicate. So you have to look at your hand and everyone kind of has to decide together, this is the time we're going to go for it. Oh, it's so fun. It's so good. I love the the game style where you're playing, or the mind, where you're playing your cards down and you're just hoping that you're in the same you know, mindset that everyone else is. You have the same groove and you play and, and you just... Yes, I bought that game on Amazon um, the second we finished playing the game, so it should arrive here any day now. It's good, and you can get it on Amazon for $15 or $20. That's it. $15 for the base game, $20 if you want to get a cute little groundhog figure. If that matters to you, you can get a cutie little groundhog uh, figurine. It's fun. I had a great time playing it, and I would like to play it again very soon. Another game that I really enjoyed that I had no idea existed is a new game called Splitter. And Splitter is a game where you will write on a card and you roll dice and you have to put one die on this half and one die on that half and it's a mirror image. So there's a dotted line that goes down the center of your grid and someone will roll the dice, let's say it's a six and a four. Well, if you place the four here on this spot, you just mirror image the four on that side. And you want to get your ones isolated, you want to get two twos next to each other with no twos, three threes in a grouping, four fours in a grouping, five fives, and six sixes. And each grouping you have of each number gives you that value. So a one isolated gives you a one, a six group isolated gives you six. And that's the game, and you have to just fill in all these spaces, mirror image based on two dice that are rolled. Really clean, really clever. Another card game that surprised me, it's another right on the cards kind of game, is called Everything on One Card. And you roll dice and then you're able to check off everything on one card that matches the dice rolled. And if you finish three of your five colors on that particular card, you score it up and you put it over on the side. There's a way to get some cool bonuses, but it's fast and it's fun and it kind of reminds me of silver and gold. And I like Silver and Gold, and this one's a dice game, and Silver and Gold's a flip and write game. It's great. After a player reaches a certain number of completed cards, the game's over, you add up your points, boom. I know that was a lot of games, but I tried to just hit the highlights of a couple of those favorites that I played every day that I was there, along with those hot games. So if you want to see the full comprehensive list of the games that I played, please look in the description below and you'll see those games, as well as some links to other resources or websites or videos that I've also talked about here in this video. So check the description, you'll see all that information down there. I have three tips and bits of advice if you ever go to BGG Con. My first one is go to the library, go to the library, check out games, be nice about the games. There are limits to the hot games that have the blue barcode. You have four hours, be respectful of everyone else and make sure you return your hot games so that other people can play those games too, but check out games. Like just go look at them, pull them off the shelf, find some friends and just play those games. Play, 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 play. All the time. <laughs> My next piece of advice is to make friends. Meet new people. Because this convention is still nearest and dearest to my heart because I just remember going every year and making new friends. And having friends now, today, that I would never have had had I not gone to the convention and had I not put myself out there. I had a friend who came and picked both Lewis and me up at the airport and dropped us off because I met him 12 or 13 years ago when his friend came and picked him up and me just because I wrote on the BGG thread that I was at Dallas Love Field and needed a ride to the hotel. And he came and got me and then I met both of them and they are both really good friends now and I never would have met them had I not been active on BGG website and I not gone to the convention and just said hey I'm gonna trust people and just have a good time and and just rely on people and so you got to make friends you got to go to tables meet people and just play some games with people that you don't know and you'll make lifelong friends I I can't see I can't see how you won't. And then you'll go back every year and you'll see those people and it's just lovely. It's just wonderful. So make friends and meet new people. And lastly, my last piece of advice is maybe practical, um, but take snacks and stay hydrated and order like Uber Eats and have them deliver it.
Um, you'll have food from anywhere in Dallas. And for someone like me who has some food restrictions in their diet, it's just such an easy way to make sure that you're staying healthy and that you can game as long as you want because you've got all the energy and all the sustenance that you need. So eat well, stay hydrated, and like you can play more games if you do that. And that's like the goal of any convention is to play as many games as you can. That's it. I will let you go for now. I just, I hope you can tell. I love Board Game Geek Con. I love seeing everybody and it was just a delight to be there and to be in person and to have that experience. And I'm going to try not to get emotional about this, but it, you know, this last year and a half or two years has been hard. It's been hard for so many people for a variety of reasons. And it's just nice to feel like maybe we can return to some things that we've been putting off for good reason, right? We all care about health and wellness of everybody. And so it's just lovely for my heart to see everybody and for my brain to have such an exciting four days of just games, 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 games. I mean, seriously, I just really like the experience and I love the atmosphere. And I cannot think of a better con than Board Game Geek Convention. So, hearts out to everybody, and hopefully I will see you there next year, 2022. Make sure to say hi to me, and hopefully we'll get to play a board game together. Go! My favorite thing! What's the game? It's got trains in it. It's like the most basic train game in the planet! <laughs> what is it? <coughs> oh, why can't I think of it? Lewis's dad really likes it. It's called 